Well, good morning once again. It's been an eventful morning. Um, I think it's important that we understand the powers that are out there. And there's a certain amount of respect that we need to have for them. They are cunning and they are persistent. Um, but we don't need to fear. As, I was, as we were praying there, the, the phrase that kept going through my head is the phrase in the song that says, we are on the Lord's side, Savior, we are thine. And that is a place of safety. <clears throat> I spoke last week on Father's Day um, to fathers, and I've been uh, asked to fill in some of the things I've left out uh, due to time constraint last week. Um, it's sort of a new experience for me to, to have to, like, well, what do I do with all this? Typically, when I get up front, I know how many notes I have, and it generally gives me a pretty good idea how long I'm going to go. Um, but um, my theory left me down last week a little bit. So <clears throat> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do that without repeating myself too much. There's probably going to be some overlap, um, but I hope it's uh, something that can be a blessing to you. I'm going to recap a little bit what I said last week. To, uh, to try to keep from popping the clutch in third gear and uh, I'm launching into the middle of it, so bear with me uh, as I do that. Um, the title of my message last week was question, uh, Lessons, Questions, and Conclusions of a Young Father. Um, and basically it was me um, articulating some of the questions and just some of the things I deal with as a father and as I face and some of the uh, conclusions and thoughts I have on that. Um, I began last week about talking about what does it mean to be the leader of my family. Um, <clears throat> the Bible is clear on, on our, our position as fathers, and I talked about that our, our job is to provide direction, to frequently ask where are we at, where do we want to go, and how do we get there. I also talked about ownership. Leadership is ownership. Accepting 100% responsibility for everything that happens in my family. Leadership is stepping to the front in the good, the bad, and the ugly. Leadership is sacrificial. Jesus is our example in that when he says, I lay down my life for the sheep. Leadership is, true leadership is not using my position to elevate myself or feed my ego, but rather laying down my life to give those entrusted, those who I've been entrusted with to lead the resources to reach the goal. <clears throat> as a leader of my home, it is my responsibility to create an environment where my family can thrive spiritually, physically, and emotionally. I then talked about priorities. I've, I looked at four areas of responsibility. Myself, my family, my work, my church, ministry and relationships, etc. And uh, which one of those are the most important? I talked about the strategy of doing first things first. And in those four categories, that, are, that I, I believe that my first responsibility is to is my relationship with God, to fill myself first so that I can then pour myself into my family. My family is my second responsibility. These are people that God has entrusted me with and I will answer to someday for how I led. The third question I touched on very briefly is the question of how do I train my children? And that's what I'm going to try to look at a little bit more in depth uh, this morning. <clears throat> Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. What does this look like? What does this training a child to equip them to, uh, to when, they, when they mature, that they have the resources and the understanding um, to, to not depart from it? Uh, one of the goals I set as a leader is, as a Christian father, is the goal is for my children to be like Jesus. That's, that's the goal. I want you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'm going to use this to um, flesh out this, this idea of training our children a little bit. I'm going to read verses 1 through 9. 
Brandon made the comment about Deuteronomy being the sermons, I think he said three, was it three sermons of Moses? And this is Moses speaking to the children of Israel. Verse 1, now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, O Israel, and oh, therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the Lord our God is the Lord. Sorry, I, I'm really butchering that. Let me start over. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Moses is giving instruction here to the Israelites, that, and I want, I'm going to say specifically the fathers, that this is their responsibility in, to, to teach their children. I want to look at, I want to look at, I want to specifically at verse 4. Actually, I should say verse 5. It says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. All has the, has the idea of the whole quantity of. It's, <laughs> it's all of it. Um, if I was supposed to give you all my money, I would end up with none for myself. And so... When Moses is here saying we need to love God, this, this love for God needs, needs to be all of our, our heart, our soul, and our strength. And uh, that's, a, that's a phrase we, we, we know very well and um, sometimes difficult. Like, how do we, how do we actually do that? Um, heart has the idea of our inner man, of our mind, and our will. Um, soul is a little bit more difficult to define a little bit. Um, some of the, some of the uh, descriptions I, I found of it is our, it's our, li- our living being or our desires, our passions, our appetites, and our emotions. Um, and then what strength? Um, the one definition was muchness um, or um, a force or abundance. And uh, if you combine all three of those, uh, it doesn't leave, doesn't leave much out. Um, it's, it's, that's, that's, what you, that's, that's what you are. It's this passion to know God with our whole being. And I believe that this is the key to the following verses. Verse 6 says, These commandments, these words which I command you today, shall be in your heart. This is, more than, this is more than knowledge. If I do verse 4, I will actually be. I don't know if you ever heard of someone talk about the phrase, describing someone that whether they're, what, something they were <laughs> passionate about or heavily involved in, you say they lived and breathed, oh, he lives and breathes, uh, whatever. Um, and uh, I think you probably know people that um, it's pretty obvious um, what they live and breathe. Um, but this pursuit of God, of knowing God, when it, when it, when it encompasses all of our being, um, it, it is what is at the core of who we are. It's the core of our life. It's who I am, a Christ follower. And because of that, it, because it's who I am, because it's in the inside, it will permeate every aspect of my life and every single thing I do. And because of that, as we look at, as we look at the verses um, 7 through 9, I want you to look at this, not as, and read it, not as a checklist of what we're supposed to do, 
but actually this is a result of what happens when we actually are, when this becomes who we are inside. Instead of something that like, okay, yes, I need to tell them this, I need to write this on the doors, I need to hang up Bible verses on my walls, which it may include all that, but this is a life. This is a life lived, and as a result of that, you will teach, I will teach my children all these things because it's who I am. It's how I live. So the first and most important step in training my children is to be. And you might ask why, and I have two things I want to look at. The first one is we learn by example. Um, You hear the the phrases that more is uh, taught than caught, or someone's a chip off the old block, or the nut doesn't fall far from the tree, and uh, we sort of say those and chuckle, but they're all very, very true. This, we learn by what is modeled for us. It's this, this example, the examples we have in our life determines what we follow and what we imitate. And especially in, a, in the home, as a father, we are, in a way, as parents, we are our children's God when they're young. And that's why it is so important for me to be what I, what I say and what I believe and what I say I believe. We imitate what we, what we observe. Once again, I want to look at the example of Jesus when he came to this earth. Like, when Jesus came to die, what did he come to earth to do? Yes, he came to provide a sacrifice, to provide redemption for us, to save us from our sins. But he could have done that in a matter of a week. But he came and lived among us. He grew up, and then he ministered for three years, I think it was, before he went to the cross. And I believe that's why he came. He came to give us an example of what it means to be a, be a, um, a Christian and to, to be like God and to live a sin-free life. And <clears throat> I would hazard a guess that his disciples learned more from being with Jesus and observing him in daily life than um, probably all the teaching that he, uh, that he did. Um, I think after he left, those teachings probably impacted and, and settled in more than they, they did when he was around. Because it seemed like sometimes they struggled to grasp what he was saying, and they had questions about it. But when he left, they knew. They knew how to live a, a life um, to, uh, to model what Jesus taught them. And I think that was, that was primarily because the example that they, that they, that they saw. Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 tells us, says, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Being is a powerful, powerful teacher. <clears throat> when they're young, there's a, when our children are young, there's a certain amount of teaching that is done by cause and effect. Um, just because I don't run around after church <laughs> doesn't mean my children uh, won't run around after church. So there is some training and stuff like that, but I, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm really thinking about this. It is, it is uh, my children are not that old yet, but I see it already of uh, <laughs> there's some many me um, and, and, and in them. And I also see it trickle down through my children, like behavior. Um, like <laughs> it's amazing what the youngest pick up by watching the oldest, just in the, you know, between the ages of, of you know, three and uh, two and eight. Um, and so that's why it is so important for, for me as a father to get this concept and put it inside me, and that is something that I actually am. <clears throat> if my children see me love unconditionally, express joy in hardship, peace in the midst of uncertainty and chaos, be patient, faithful, gentle, and self-controlled, they will have the best idea or the best way when they are faced with those things to, how, to, to know how to deal with them. The second point I want to think about is the importance of being authentic. 
Authenticity is a little bit of a popular word uh, right now in some circles, and uh, like everyone's trying to be authentic, and this is the authentic me, and uh, some of that's good. <laughs> some of it, some people's authentic, uh, authenticness. Um, <laughs> you wish they wouldn't. Um, it gets a little, this a little, gets a little in your face at times. But I want to think of all, uh, authenticity as it's simply being genuine. It's what you are. Um, I think of authenticity as there's no gap between who I portray versus who I am. They're the one and the same. And this is something that, that I, I've really, really had to come to terms with. Um, that I am what I say, and I say what I am. It's being, it's this thing, it's being a doer. In James chapter uh, 2, verses 22, you can turn there if you'd like, <clears throat> it says, But be a doer of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For when he observes himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what manner of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one is blessed in his deeds. <clears throat> it's amazing how capable I am of deceiving myself. I'm going to use an example. And this is, I could give you multiple examples, but this is probably the most benign one. Um, I like to think of myself as a runner. I uh, have an interest in running. Um, some of you, in conversations with me, may think I'm a runner, just because of some of the stuff I say. Um, but there's one very, very telling factor that determines if I am or not. I have this app that um, tracks my runs. Um, I wear a watch, it tracks my runs, and it loads it into that, and it keeps a record. Um, I think that I, I checked, I think my first run was in 2018. Um, and then it gives you a, a, a for year to date, like a year to date, how much you've run, but also gives you an all time. And then it gives you an average of what you've run weekly. So <laughs> last night I checked my average. This year I'm averaging four minutes a week of running. I'm not a runner. I have the shoes, I have the watch, I have the gear. I can talk to you about running. I can portray the fact that I am a runner because of my knowledge, but I'm not. I'm not a runner because I don't do. And there's so many times in my life that I portray something. I may have, this, I may have theory and stuff, but it's not, if, if I'm not, that's not being authentic. That is making a gap between who I am and who I portray. The impact of what I say depends on what I do. My children will judge the validity of what I say by what I do and what they have experienced. That's just, you, we can't get away from that. Doing gives credibility. There's so much theory out there. There's words are so cheap, there's so many experts. But in our day, there's very, very few people that actually do. But when we do, when we practice what we preach, when I do, when I, when I am what I say, and I say what I do, it gives credibility to what I say. It builds trust. And trust is one of the most important ingredients of leading. You can't trust someone, you can't follow someone you don't trust. The opposite is also true. If I do not, if I say, but do not do, the impact is just as profound on my children. I think in Ephesians 6, 4, where it says, and you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. I think this is probably what he's referring to here. There's nothing more distasteful and frustrating for my children than hypocrisy of requiring, of asking something of them 
that I am not able to do myself. Children are incredibly intuitive. They know what's up. They know if dad's for real. They know my weaknesses. They know my vices. And that's why it's so, so important for me to live what I say. Because there will come a time, I mean, my children are young, but they are, they are learning right now. They are picking up on who I actually am. And there's going to come a time, probably sooner than I expect, that they will begin to question what I do or what I say against what I do. <clears throat> I'm not asking, I'm not saying we have to be perfect as fathers, but we need to be perfectly honest. Sometimes I have this false idea that as a leader, if I'm not perfect or I admit failure, it's going to destroy my credibility as a dad and as a father. But in fact, it's actually the opposite. It's really, really difficult to, someone, to follow someone that thinks they're perfect because we all know no one is. But if there's someone that can, if, if there's someone that can if, uh, in a position of authority, can admit their mistakes and ask for forgiveness and humble themselves, those are the people you trust. <clears throat> My children need to hear me confess and ask for forgiveness for when I step out of what I say. They know. There's instances where I have acted out of frustration and anger to my children and even in their young, in their young years. And I get convicted and I go back and I say, you know what, I'm sorry. I was mad. And you can see it in their eyes. They know. And so that's why as, as a father, it's, important, it's so important, as, as a father, it's so important for me to be authentic, to be honest with where I am and be willing to admit my mistakes. <clears throat> well, my last conclusion is this. I said at the, in, my, in my first message that the Bible does not say much about parenting. But that's actually not true. It's full of instruction on how to be a parent. Because God has modeled for us how to be a father. And if he is our father as parents, then we will have the example and the model to follow to be parents to our children. That's been a great comfort to me when I look at, try to navigate all the voices out there that tell you how to parent, when to parent, when not to parent, and things like that. But if I follow Jesus and I know him personally as my father, and I take that and pass that on to my children and treat them and relate to them as God relates to me, I will succeed at being a parent. That's pretty much what I have to share. As I share some of the lessons that I'm learning, the questions that I have, and the conclusions that, I co that I'm coming to, I hope it's been an encouragement to you wherever you find, whatever place you find yourself, whether you're a dad or not, whether you're a young father or an old father. I should say older father. Fatherhood never ends. It begins at the birth of your child and ends with your grave. Whether your children are home or whether they're, they're not, you're a father. You're still influential. You still have an ability to model for them. To us young fathers, remember that the, the answer to life's seemingly complex questions, that the answer is more often than not in doing the simple things well. There's very, very obvious things that the scriptures ask for us and calls us to. Do those well. Lean into being a dad. Lean into being a father. Embrace this position that you have. And endeavor not to just to be a good dad. Let's be great dads. Let's lead with integrity and humility. Let's be for real. And 
with our relentless pursuit of knowing God and pleasing him, model for them what it means to be a follower of Christ. That they be able to say that because we were their dad, they have caught a glimpse of Jesus. And set the foundation for them and their relationship with their Heavenly Father. I was afraid that last part was going to get me. <clears throat> Thanks again for your attention and your uh, uh, grace as I spoke. I pray, like I said, I pray it's been an encouragement to you and uh, as fathers that we fulfill our responsibility to the best of our ability. Are there any thoughts before we close?